Tim, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Jamie. I'm doing very well, thank you. How, how are things with you? Not too bad, thanks. Not too bad, considering all the strange things going on in the world at the moment. But uh... Yes. To say that we're living in challenging times is to completely underst- understate the situation that we're all in. It is. I said to one of my guests recently that it's even shifted the standard English default of just saying, I'm fine when people ask you how you are. I think even that default is <laughs> tough to hold up for some people. But regardless, it's brilliant to have you join this sentientist conversation. And what I'm trying to do in these conversations is structure them around what I see as the two most important philosophical questions, what's real and what matters morally. And I'm setting them in the context of this recasting of sentientism, which I'm describing as a very simple pluralistic worldview that only really has two tenets it says when we're thinking about what's real we should use reason and evidence and a naturalistic worldview and when we think about what matters morally we should think about sentience as the grounding of all moral values we should extend our moral compassion to all sentient beings but having said that i'm talking to people who agree with sentientism who disagree with it we see where the conversation goes Uh, But before we go into those two questions, it would be great for people who don't know you, if you wouldn't mind introducing your life and your work. And it feels strange to ask you to do that in a couple of minutes, given I've just finished reading Growl, your awesome book, which gives a a 300 page answer to that question. But how would you sum it up? Thank you for reading Growl and for the kind remark about it. My background is a very ordinary working class family in Surrey with nothing extraordinary about it, really. Kind, loving parents, a sister, one cat whose name was Tinkerbell, and the sort of turning points which set the direction of my life were in my teen years when, as a student, one summer in 1973, I worked in a chicken slaughterhouse and consequently became a vegetarian in 1974 and then I became a vegan in 1976 and purely by luck I became the second full-time employee at Compassion and World Farming later in 1976 and ever since then as a vegan I've worked professionally with animal organizations primarily in the United States and the UK but also with organizations in Europe and around the world. Thank you. And it's been an amazing contribution. And what I found from reading Growl was one, there's clearly a a, a deeply personal story that you're very frankly telling the world as you go through that story, but the sheer range of contributions you've made and the organisations you've worked with uh, across the pond and here is um, quite mind blowing. So um, it's great to have you here to share your sort of personal philosophical journey as well. And the first of those two questions that I like to center these conversations around is is what's real. So for many people, that's a story about whether they grew up in a sort of naturalistic or an atheistic household, whether they grew up in a religious uh, or a more spiritual or mystical household, how their philosophy about what's real has shifted over time and where they've got to now. So that's a question that's somewhat distinct from the focus of your life in helping non-human animals. But from reading your story, it does seem that there are themes around naturalism, supernaturalism, spirituality, and so on that have connected with your life's work as well. So it'd be fascinating to know your journey on that front. And you can go back as early into childhood as you feel comfortable. They say that we were a default Church of England family without Mm. any particular commitment to it other than that's what you were. And not that I went to church, but I was raised to to believe in God without any real severe restrictions being placed upon adhering to that belief. And But I do know that my parents, especially my mum, she encouraged us to be kind to animals and encouraged us to become, us being my sister and I, and to become members of the RSPCA when we were at uh, school. And I can remember quite clearly pledging allegiance, as it were, to opposing animal cruelty when I became a member of the RSPCA. But there was there were sort of beginnings of the animal issue percolating around that time. So, for example, I can remember in my teen years that we had a, a chest freezer, one of those ones where you could pull up the lid and it was a big sort of coffin-like chest. Mm. 
and my dad had arranged for a pig to be slaughtered for us for a local in a local farm and and the day that my mum knew the pig was to be killed for us she was very upset that day and I remember talking to her about it albeit briefly but I do remember it and I think she always wanted to work with animals but never had the opportunity so we were raised in working class home with strong labor traditions mm. labor identity and with a commitment to 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 opposing cruelty to animals and being kind to animals later as I became a vegetarian and I was from working in the chicken slaughterhouse I can remember, and I would tell this story in Growl, that I thought that my mum should also become a vegetarian. And we had quite fierce arguments about it in the period of time when I had become a vegetarian and and was living at home. And she very graciously would cook, learn how to cook vegetarian meals for me. And this was in the 1970s. So there wasn't a tremendous amount of information around uh, to be able to do this. But we would argue about it. And I was quite... As a young man, I was quite arrogant and self-confident in my beliefs. And uh, so we had quite a heated arguments about it. And then eventually we had to call a truce because it got quite quite poisonous in atmosphere. Mm. And then some time passed and I couldn't help myself. And I started up at, uh, arguing with her again about why wasn't she a vegetarian? She should be a vegetarian. She should know she should be a vegetarian and, and et cetera. And she turned to me to say, when was the last time you saw me eat meat? And of course, she had given up eating meat and I was too blinded to actually notice. And of course, that sort of shut me up for a while. So then then (laughs) mum and I became, we then travelled the road to being vegetarian together. And my sister subsequently became vegetarian, as did my dad. And and then also, mum and I also discovered veganism together basically and we went vegan together and again my, my father and my sister had to follow on with all of this mm. as far as anything spirituality there, there was a, a period in my life around this time when um, I only really knew two vegetarians both women the first was the one who influenced me to go vegetarian and then the second one was someone who I knew in the local in the town where I was born and raised and she was raised in a family of vegetarians. She was a lifelong vegetarian, but they were also theosophists. Mm. And so we eventually got to learn more about what theosophy was. And this is something that I haven't really talked a great deal about, but I find that the sort of fundamental tenets of theosophy have stayed with me over the period of time. And I know theosophy has a somewhat controversial history behind it, but the, the theosophy that I was introduced to was the study of the actual original books, facsimile editions of the books written by the founder of Theosophy, Francis H.P.B., was the Madame Blavatsky. But the, basically in that belief system was a commitment to the fact that everything was interrelated, that everything was sentient, basically, and there was a great bias towards vegetarianism and, and opposing animal cruelty. And so those kind of fundamental values have stayed with me and they've been mm. influenced by the philosophy that I've learned subsequently to, since I became full-time advocate for animals with ver- working for various organisations. Yeah, thank you. And did your, I guess, the background default Christianity and that of your mum in particular, did that link into your thinking about compassion for animals or were they independent parts of your thinking in those early days? I think they were there, but they weren't key characters. Yeah. They were part of a general sort of background of respect and kindness and and compassion. Yeah. And was there a point where you felt you were actually moving away from Christianity or giving it up, or did it just fade into the background for you and you learned about different views and philosophies like theosophy? It's a mixture of the two, really, in the, the gradually I found myself moving away from Christianity, whereas it was the default position, how you would describe yourself. Yeah. And so I can remember having the realization that I thought, I'm not a Christian. And I actually took quite a lot of pleasure in shocking people by saying, I'm not a Christian. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I just don't believe in it anymore. Yeah. And I don't believe in it for various reasons. So, yes, there was a clear break in my mind that in my belief systems that 
that Christianity was no longer relevant. I'd say that I have my own personal spiritual belief system, mm. um, which is a bit of a, a, a mixed bag of a bit of this and a bit of that. And in Growl, I talk about the four key values, which I try to use as a uh, foundation for, for everything that I do. I wouldn't say that I was a Buddhist. I wouldn't say that I was a theosophist or, or anything. I, I do say I'm a vegan, but I don't label myself with any spiritual belief system. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And it, it's interesting as people, because I grew up in a sort of similar context, Christianity was a default. It wasn't really a central thing in our lives. It didn't constrain me. It didn't really drive what we did. We'd go to church Christmas and Easter, and that was pr- pretty much it. But it was still interesting how it did seem to infuse into the culture and the community, and it was an expected default, as you say. And even in that quite soft context, it still took me quite a few years in my teenage years to move away from that. Some people I've spoken to have had much more difficult, traumatic journeys from a sort of religious context because of the level of commitment that was expected from their community. And that wasn't the case for you, for you or me. So in a way, it was quite an easy journey. But some people tend to move away from those religious structures, certainly organized religion, because of an epistemological disagreement. So they look at the evidence and the facts and they think the story just doesn't stack up. You know, I think about other religions, you look at the sociological history of religion and you think it just doesn't feel like it's real. For other people, it's more looking at some of the ethics that flow from religious systems as well. So they might look at a deity being prioritized above sentient beings and being seen as more important, or they might look at various types of discrimination that tend to flow from organized religion. So sometimes it's more of an ethical disconnect that makes people move away as well. But without putting words in your mouth, it feels like you've taken some of the compassion that flows through those ways of thinking that your family shared, and you've continued that while letting go some of the you know, epistemological stuff or the more specific things which you just don't see are well-founded or ethical. Is that a fair summary? I think so. I would say that the it, it was the visceral experience of working in a chicken slaughterhouse, mm. and the I didn't work on the killing part of the production line, but on the post killing part part of the production line, and it was that visceral experience which I think was the, the fundamental experience that that challenged me to think differently about virtually everything. Yeah, and the seeds of that were placed by my parents. And in Growl, I talk about as a child seeing a, a woman uh, called Camberley Kate. Camberley yeah. was the town where I was born and raised, and Camberley Kate was a, a single working class woman who spent her meagre funds on rescuing many dogs, and she was quite an eccentric personality in in the town. And I can remember watching her thinking. Why does someone do this? It was intriguing, although she scared me to death, and I would never speak to her. But I would love to have had the opportunity to talk to her now. But uh, sadly, that's not the case. So the, I think what's driven me and what continues to drive me is the outrage that I feel about what happens to animals. Yeah, and and the exposure that I was so fortunate to have. In from the 1970s onwards, once I was working full time for animal groups, of being able to hear and speak and work with the key philosophers in animal rights, that they are not being trained to be able to read or understand philosophy and having to be self-taught. But what that experience did for me was was help me unscramble my thoughts in my head as to what I was thinking because of those visceral experiences about how animals were uh, abused and killed. Yeah. And it, and I guess that's the second question we focus these conversations around, what matters morally. And the sense I get from what you say and from your writing is that the core of it is an ability to identify with the experience of another sentient being and however imperfectly to imagine what their life, what their experience is, and to identify with that compassionately and, and lots of, Lots of the other thinking flows from that. And the philosophers you've talked to and learned from and helped develop their own thinking, whether it's a rights-based approach or utilitarian approach or something else, they feel like they fit around that core of acknowledging the sentience of other beings and what that means morally. Is that Yes, I think you're absolutely correct. Talk about having four key values and 
compassion yeah. is the first of those and the compassion more than empathy or sympathy compassion for me means not only being able to experience what happens to others but it's the motivation to want to yeah. do something about it and and so absolutely yes i'm i can quite easily imagine myself and put myself to some limited extent into the situation that animals are in and feel it and and be absolutely angered and outraged by it and wanting to do something to stop it. Yeah. And that's, to link the two topics, one of the reasons that some people are hesitant about moving away from maybe a religious system of thought is because I I happen to think they're pretty poorly founded and can be dangerous ethical systems, but they're often reasonably clear or at least provide the pretense of being clear so that when you say, why is this thing good or why is this thing bad morally, the answer is, well, because it doesn't accord with God's wishes or it doesn't fit with this list of commandments or what's written down in this holy book. So uh, some people are nervous that giving up that specificity, if you like, of moral structure leaves them uh, without a mooring, without a moral foundation. How would you answer the question, okay, but why should we care morally about other sentient beings, human or non-human? Or is that a ridiculous question to ask because the answer is so obvious. Yes and no, it's a ridiculous question. And I think that the first point I would want to make is that I have learned that whether any ideology is uh, spiritually based or politically based or any other uh, flavor of being based, mm. ideal ideologies by themselves are good things, but they can be, as you say, very dangerous things. Mm. And I've learned that no one ideology fits and addresses everything that's right and wrong about yeah. the world that we're in. And I, and I always beware of anyone who says, this is the one true way, this is the one ideology, that, that w- whatever the ideology is, that is the answer to everything. And I think, no, I don't think so. I think you're traveling quite quickly down the road towards uh, fascism more than anything else. Mm-hmm. The question about, I think you're asking me in a way, why do animals matter? And and why do animals, why do what we do to animals matter? Mm -hmm. And they, I think animals matter because we are animals. And what we do to them, we do to ourselves in, in general terms. And what we do to them is unacceptable. And so it's stupid in, in the terms of the consequences that we have to then consequently deal with from abusing animals. And I just don't want to live in a world where, regardless of species, human or animal, where individuals are treated with um, such disrespect and, and such lack of compassion and just essentially being exploited because we can exploit them. Yeah. There's no other reason why much of the exploitation of animals happens other than because we have the power to be able to do it. And if we didn't have that power to be able to do it, it wouldn't be done. Yeah. And we need legislation as well as training, teaching people to be ethical and res- respectful and compassionate in order to stop us from doing what we currently do to animals and, and to other people and to the planet. And whether we'll ever be successful in that regard, I, we, I don't know. I certainly don't think I'll see a great deal of success in my lifetime, but we, were going to be, we are going to be forced to deal with the consequences of it sooner or, la- or later. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the, the, I think once you've put aside a supernatural morality, which says good and bad are defined by some deity or some list of rules, once you've said, look, we're going to have a more naturalistic morality that's grounded just in reality and and the world as we experience it it's to me it's almost tautological that morality almost by definition is a concern for others right i'm not sure what else the word could even mean and if we're going to have a concern for others those others have to have some form of experience some ability to suffer and flourish that we can have a concern about and that is really sentient so to my mind It does become almost, that's why I said it's almost a ridiculous question for me, because it's almost definitional. If you're going to have a moral, if you're going to decide to be moral in the first place, and of course, people can decide not to be moral if they don't want to be moral. Hopefully the rest of us will constrain them. But if you are going to be moral, that implies a concern for others. And to my mind, there's no logical reason why you would restrict that moral consideration, that compassion, 
two subsets of beings that can suffer, surely all suffering matters. So it does become almost tautological. But in a way, it, to me, for me, it answers that question of if you don't have a supernatural grounding for your morality, what can the grounding be? And the gra- grounding for me is in a naturalistic understanding of sentient beings and what sentience is. It doesn't mean we understand it perfectly, but it feels like a very solid, robust, naturalistic grounding for morality that is pretty strong. But there are at least a couple of ways that people can criticise that focus on sentience when we're defining our moral circle or whatever moral shape of compassion we want to extend. And one, I don't think we need to spend too much time on, which is that sentience goes too far. And actually, we should restrict our compassion to humans only, or maybe humans and companion animals and certain charismatic wild animals. And some people even restrict their compassion and their moral consideration to subgroups of humans. And we know what the harm that those forms of discrimination can cause as well. And I think you and I agree that there's, that's really, those are really arbitrary restrictions and that you know, there's no reason to exclude any sentient being from moral consideration. That doesn't mean we can help them all. It doesn't mean the answers are practical or easy, but at least in terms of considering their moral value, all sentient beings should count. But there's also another challenge to focusing on sentience, which is actually that it doesn't go far enough. So some people who take a you know, a biocentrist or an ecocentrist or a holistic stance would say, in a way, and I think this was the first time the word sentientist was actually used, was as a criticism to say, look, there's a, re- there's a risk that sentientism is just another form of discrimination. We're discriminating against non-sentient beings. Now, my answer to that is that non-sentient beings can't experience suffering or flourishing, so don't have any intrinsic moral value, but they can have enormous instrumental value rocks and rivers and trees in the environment and ecosystems are deeply important but really they're only important because of their impact on sentient beings whereas some people will say no rocks and rivers and trees and plants actually have intrinsic moral worth in their own in their own um, essence as well and so i'd be interested to know whether you do draw a boundary around sentence in that in a similar way or do you extend further and you mentioned the theosophy perspective tends to be one of more holism, more connectedness, and maybe a broader concept of what sentience really is, going beyond things that can technically experience suffering. I subscribe to the latter view, which is that I think that, uh, of the ones you stated, which is that, for I know, rocks may be sentient, Mm. and they may be sentient in their own way. We're just not able to, to see or experience or understand what that sentiency is. I'm intrigued with the ideas that certain rivers in India are considered to be deities. Mm. And when we know that everything is interconnected, that nothing is separate, the, that if some, if some piece of that is, is sentient, then possibly everything that is connected to it could possibly be sentient, regardless of whether we have the ability to, to be able to recognize it or not. We haven't really traveled that many years to go from the position of generally accepting that animals aren't sentient yeah. um, or even certain groups of people aren't sentient. Who knows? You know, we are such finite, limited beings in of ourselves, even though we are connected to a greater whole. But our abilities are really quite, I think, quite poor in being able to experience the tr- truly experience the world that we're in. And we're very conscious of the physical world. There are non-physical worlds that exist, which, which we may not be or cannot uh, c- connect with. And so going from a point of view, you know, of the default Christian, whereby I, there is God, there is me, right. and there's a relationship between us, and, we, we, and I'm this sort of person on this planet Earth, to the fact that there is a universe out there and and we are part of that universe and our ability to even understand and comprehend and our ability for our minds to grasp that universe is just so inadequate. Yeah. And so the benefit of the doubt should be given to the fact that rocks may or may not have consciousness as we don't know. They may have a, a form of consciousness of, the, of their own. Now that could be dismissed by some as being a silly a spiritual uh, fluffery, mm. but it also is important from the point of view that how we treat rocks is very or is very important um, because rocks are part of the world and whether a rock is a pebble on the beach here in Hastings or whether it's a, a mountain in, in the Himalayas. Um, the fact of the matter is that it, it exists and how we treat and view it 
is very important and has and has consequences as we as we are regrettably understanding today. Yeah. And I think you make a really important point, and I have to remind myself of this as well. So one of the two central tenets of the, the sentientism idea is that we have a naturalistic approach, but there's a danger that that can sometimes come across as quite scientistic and quite arrogant. We have all the evidence, we have all the facts, the debate is over, we have the answers. And I think that's a sort of insidious problem within many schools of thought. It's obviously a problem in some religious dogmatic schools of thought, but it can also be a problem in a sort of scientific dogma as well, in that you get so confident in the answers that you stop looking. And I think actually the the real core of a naturalistic or a scientific approach is having a deep sense of humility and a deep sense of open-mindedness. And as you said, a recognition of how wrong we've been in the past, that should lead us to have some humility about our ability as humans to engage with and understand in the wo- and understand the world. So personally, I remain open-minded about those topics. I guess my view on sentience is while I remain open-minded, I do take a more a tr- traditional view, which is that I-, I see sentience really as a class of advanced information processing that evolved out of biological entities' ability to model themselves and their components in an environment. That sounds like a quite, quite a weird technical way of explaining it, but I think there's an evolutionary drive that led certainly very early animals and ultimately us to be able to monitor ourselves in a way that actually generates this subjective experience that you and I think are having now. So when I think about assessing the sentience of other beings, which I see as an important thing to do, given I do think it's a central criteria for moral considerability, we can't know for sure whether another being is sentient. So I've got very high degree of confidence that you're sentient, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, All I can see is this screen. But you and I have a very common evolutionary history. So you'd imagine that that those pressures might have led us to have similar capabilities. If you put us under an fMRI scanner, we'd examine each other's neurons and firings and patterns. I'm pretty sure we'd see some massive overlaps in you know, how you operate architecturally, if you like, it seems a bit clinical. So that combination of evolutionary history, but observing behavior and interaction and looking at information processing architecture, I think are the three ways I'd think about imperfectly assessing the sentience of something else. So that my default view while remaining open-minded is that leads me to think that mammals, reptiles, birds, fish, certainly most of the invertebrates, humans are all sentient in varying degrees. I think there's some open questions about some of the very, very simplest animals. Sea sponge is classified as an animal, but has no nervous system whatsoever. So to my mind, it's unlikely they're sentient. But these views aren't 100% cast in stone views. And sentientism as a philosophy doesn't have a list of which species are sentient either. It just says, follow the science and remain open-minded. So that's where I end up in a more traditional view about where the boundary of sentience is. So I'd say that plants, for example, they communicate in rich ways they have complex behaviours, but I don't see at this moment any evidence that they have the sort of information processing architecture that would generate a subjective experience. But I remain open-minded about it. Yeah, it can go both ways, though. I, mm. I accept what you're saying, and I don't find myself in disagreement with what you're saying. But I think that we do tend to have an assumption that the human animal is the pinnacle of evolution, mm. and that we may not be the pinnacle of evolution. There may Absolutely. be further <laughs> beings, sentency, which is more advanced than we are, but we're not aware of it. And I don't know whether they there or they are there or, or not. But I, I think that we have to be mindful of the fact that they could be yeah. and that we aren't as the the, the the sum total is so far of nature's advance into being the most perfect, evolved human being. There may be other life forms out there which are more advanced than us and even been able to Give, give up the physical body and then exist in a completely different form than what we are forced to do in, in existing in this physical world. So I, I think yeah. that we just need to be mindful of the fact that we're constantly learning, not only from a scientific point of view, but from also a philosophical point of view or even a spiritual point of view. As I say, I'm intrigued by the idea that is just generally accepted by a large group of people in India that the certain rivers are gods to them. Yeah. And... Um, now, it doesn't mean to say that those rivers are being treated very well uh, because they're some of the most polluted rivers in the world. But <laughs> yeah. the fact of the matter is that they, they're, they're, they have a mind view which is uh, broader than the more Western worldview that, that we have. We don't consider rivers to be deities. Or even, the, I, I don't want to say that I think a river is a deity, but I want to say that I think a river is a being 
of its own kind that deserves our respect and compassion and that we need to have an honest and non-violent relationship with that river. Yeah. And I think there's there's two ways where that theme of thinking, I think, can have challenges. And I think you avoid both of them. But I'd, it'd be interesting to lay them out. One is where that mode of thinking puts some sort of non-sentient entity as more important than sentient entities. And another is where because people have extended their moral circle so broadly, they're still neglecting some of the beings that definitely are sentient. This will annoy some of the environmentalists and conservationists that are listening to this, but it feels to me like the centre of gravity in the environmentalist movement, for example, is we have a compassion for a universal compassion for all humans and all humanity. Because of the threats to humanity of climate change and environmental destruction, we're going to push our moral consideration out really broadly So we now care about ecosystems and biodiversity and the planet as Gaia and these wider concepts. And that's potentially quite a positive ethical movement because it's extending that moral consideration further. But most of those people still exclude really obviously sentient farmed animals and most non-charismatic wild animals from their moral consideration at the same time. So in a way, my perspective is I'm quite comfortable with people pushing their moral consideration beyond sentience if they want to, as long as they don't exclude any of the things that really are obviously sentient from their consideration while they're doing it. Because it feels to me like much of the modern environmental movement is really just another reflection of an anthropocentric way of thinking. It's not really a genuine extension of compassion at all. But I don't think your perspective falls foul of either of those problems. It's a genuine extension of compassion that clearly deeply includes the moral value of you know, all sentient human and non-human animals at the same time. Yes, um, I, I think your analysis of the environmental movement is correct. I mean, the, the, my, my, the two notes I made to myself are things to say are that, that it's not a competition. As the circle of compassion gets extended, which isn't necessarily a mental view that I subscribe to, but, yeah. but for those who do, that once the, the circle of compassion is extended, that previously hitherto excluded beings are now being included into the circle, and it does get framed as if it, there is a competition, a competition of interest amongst these beings. I totally reject the idea that there's a competition. There is, we only made the competition because of our arrogance. But in, in reality, there is, no, there is no competition because everything is just is. It just exists. And the, the key thing, I think, is not so much of the, there's individual, regardless of their existence in the world, what species there are, it's not the fact that there, there are all these individual things in, or beings. It's the fact that it's the relationship between them. It, and, and I think it's the, it, what is more real, more relevant, is the interrelationships that exist between and among everything. And the, because the relationships between and among everything is so important, that it, you reject the concept of extending a circle. Because... There is no circle. We are, we are already are in, we are the circle. We're only manufacturing this belief system to, to, to satisfy our curiosity, to believe that we are extending the, the circle of compassion. But in reality, everything is so interrelated and it's the interrelationships between everything that I think is, the, is the far more important than perhaps even the individual beings themselves. And so this is where ecofeminism rings true for me for example Mm. because it places an emphasis upon everything being equal for want of a better word and that everything has that interrelationship amongst everything and that the interrelationships are really critical in understanding you know what is happening and and the consequences of of our actions are damaging those interrelationships our relationship with that river is being damaged because of what we do to it. And I think there's there's a really important point about the moral circle. I find it quite a useful concept, but there's a danger in it as well because it implies that us humans are right in the centre and controlling. Mm. And that links to your challenge, your point of caution about using sentience as well because there's a danger that we use ourselves as, as a model and as a standard and measure everything against that, which again is just another anthropocentric way of judging how human-like something is as a way of assessing its value. And in a way, it's difficult, you know, maybe impossible to uh, 
completely get away from a human centric point of view because we are humans. But I think that's a really important counter. And, and part of the intent behind focusing on sentience, you might see it almost as a counter to humanism, is that it's trying to focus on sentience as a characteristic and a capability that existed many millions of years before humans even came on the scene. So I totally agree with your point earlier that we're not at some sort of pinnacle standard. Arguably, every animal that exists today is at the cutting edge of evolutionary progress, if there even is such a thing. And I don't see why we should limit our conception of sentience to you know, where humans are at the moment. There's no reason we're at any sort of pinnacle whatsoever. But your point about relations is interesting as well, because I think that's another area where maybe our perspectives differ slightly, but at the same time overlap, because I see relations as richly and deeply important because of our interconnectedness, not just between sentient beings, but obviously with the non-sentient environment as well, or, or with everything. Ultimately, that connectedness is incontrovertible, and it's just a fact of reality. So I do see those relations as important. But the reason I see them as important is because of their impact on individual sentience, if you, whereas I think you see a more intrinsic value in the relations themselves. But I think there's a massive overlap, because that means that both you and I see those relations as deeply important, just for slightly different ways. And one of my hesitations, again, about a more relational focused approach is that there's a danger in some circumstances that those, the way those relations are defined can also be a bit anthropocentric and, and self-centered in that arguably, you know, the categorization of certain non-human animals is uh, a result of certain powerful humans describing uh, a set of relations with other sentient beings where those other beings aren't involved in the negotiation about the nature of those relations and those defined relations and those power structures are then used to carry out awful harm on those non-humans. So in a way, I guess where my amateur thinking gets to this is I quite like the relational approach because it's rich and deep and it's really important to the sentient experiences of sentience that I see as the core of moral value. But whatever relational approach we take... I think it's still useful to us as, as a safety mechanism or as a bulwark against oppression that we recognize that the suffering and flourishing of individual sentient beings is a foundational importance and something that no relational structure or no you know, political cool no get negotiation about morals should be allowed to attack and undermine. So whatever relational structure, whatever relativistic morality you might want to come up with, needlessly causing suffering is still seen as a moral negative. So it's almost there as a backstop. I don't know if that is a resolution or a, a synthesis of those perspectives. No, I think what helpful. you said makes sense. I don't find myself in, in, in disagreement with it. And w one of the things that will be interesting to come on to in the final section of the, the conversation, and you've touched on it already, is implications for the future. So I think you and I have slightly different perspectives, but I think we share most of nearly all of your the four values you put forward in your book that truth that compassion that commitment to non-violence that commitment to justice i think those are things that i'd sign up to in in, in a heartbeat so this final section is thinking about the future and i you can i know you you like to pretend you're grumpy but i like to try and set this in an optimistic i i, I like to try and set this in an optimistic cast and say look if we could imagine that we could get more of the 8 billion people on the planet to agree with you and me about truth and compassion and nonviolence and justice. What could that future look like? And then in, more, in a more challenging context, which you spend your life working on, you know, how do you think we can move forward towards that sort of future? Uh, what the future could look like. And you can go uh, sci-fi or you can go more immediate term and pragmatic, depending on how utopian yeah. you're feeling. There are so many different ways to answer this question, and it's such yeah. a fundamental question. And on a more sort of mundane level, as far as what, how do I assess the animal rights movement and the progress, assess the progress that it's making, and it is making progress. But I think fundamentally, it's, it, it continues to neglect a very important area, which is making animal rights a mainstream political issue. Yeah. And we're constantly failing to really get involved with party politics and working within political parties to advance the animal issue. There are some very good groups that are doing that. And one of them is the Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation, for example, though I am not a conservative, I do support all the work that they do. Yeah. And you make an important point there that these topics can span the political spectrum. You know, these ideas of taking a compassionate approach and using a naturalistic approach, 
they aren't they necessarily, can, rest, aren't necessarily restricted to a particular political stance. I, I agree with you, but I think that they can live more happily and more appropriately in in more to the left of the spectrum than to, yeah. to the to the right of the spectrum. The on a more larger picture, what would the future look like? I think us as humans, as a spe- as a species. We need to get over the fact that we are not the pinnacle of evolution. We are not the pinnacle of the best that there right. is. We are just one of many uh, species that we coexist with on this planet. And our arrogance as a species is really our, our come uppance. And the more that we're able to understand ourselves more rightfully and more appropriately, within this complex interlocking web of life, the, the more we will be able to live in a way that is sustainable. And I think satisfactory it gives us much greater satisfaction. We live in a particular point in time where the coronavirus pandemic is challenging the values that we have created within society, with the obsession with work, with the obsession with an accumulation of physical items behind me and around me. There's 2,000 plus books here. So I'm as guilty of this as anyone else. But we've got ourselves into a corner in developing a way of living and a sense of entitlement of of our existence on this planet, which is going to, which is uh, not going to, it is causing us a tremendous amount of problems. And so when I think to the future, I think that we have to do a lot of work on ourselves as individuals and as a species because we are the problem. The way in which we see the world, the way in which we live in the world is the problem. And our ability to be able to tackle that, I think, is going to be the answer to the question as to whether the future looks optimistic or it doesn't. I don't think it does. And I think that there's going to be a lot of pessimistic things that's going to happen before uh, we can actually wake up and and make that realization yeah and it's i I think you're right this sort of human supremacist or this arrogant human exceptionalist approach isn't even good for us and uh, unfortunately we're going to have to feel direct reality of that before we're uh, ready to learn and change. And it's a shame. Wouldn't it be nice if we could think and moralize and plan and analyze and do the right thing? But it does feel too often the human race is like the toddler that's told not to put its hand in the fire, just will not learn until it's actually put its hand in the fire. <laughs> and it's deeply frustrating. Yeah. And, and at the same time, social changes always feel way too painfully slow for people who are going through them. But at the same time, as you did in Growl, we look back at some social change movements and think, that was incredible. Look how quickly that changed and how radically it changed and how quickly those very different ways of thinking and being became just accepted as a norm. I sometimes try and hang on to that as an optimistic sense that if we can get to a tipping point, maybe things will switch. Because most of the things we're talking about, as you've said, aren't, they're not trade-offs. They're not choices between human welfare and non-human welfare and the environment. Most of the things we're proposing, if we were put in charge today, would be a win for humans, non-humans, the environment uh, as a whole. Some of them trivially, obviously, but it doesn't mean it's easy to persuade others to, to agree with us. I think fundamentally we need to be less selfish and more altruistic yeah. and, and less consuming and, more, and less material in the values that we have in the way in which we live. Let me finish up by forcing you against your character to be utopian (laughs) and to imagine that the animal advocacy movement gets much more serious about political engagement and that we do find some sort of tipping point between individual altruism and commercial interests and political dynamics that takes national governments and local governments and even regional or international governance forums to take these subjects seriously we get to the point where there's a universal definition of sentient rights not just a universal definition of human rights i've had a go at drafting one or where we've reworked all the sustainable development goals to fully reflect the moral value of sentient beings as well and go 100 years out in the future what would your vision of that utopian future be like 
Because I think we need to focus on the, the reality of the horrors that we're making happen today. But sometimes I think it's also useful to dream a little bit about how different it could be. I don't, you can refuse to if you like, but... No, no, I'm happy to do this. I think that I do, we do it all the time. We do have our minds are constantly yeah. thinking about what are we actually working toward it, trying to achieve in, in, in very material ways, in immediate ways. So 100 years from now, I would hope that 100 years from now, the, fact, the, the intensive commercial industrial exploitation of animals is over. So in the areas of farming, in, in, animal, in research, in sucking fish out of the sea, yeah. all those kinds of things, I think, should be over yeah. because they are unsustainable. They don't work. Even and from a selfish human point of view? Even from a selfish point of view, absolutely, yes. That they, they do more harm to humans than they, do ben- than they bring benefits. And they are an infrastructure which is, which is without sustainability behind it. The, the infra- there is no infrastructure holding it up. And I think that, that 100 years from now, you know, factory farming will be over, and I think a lot of animal research will be over. And hopefully animals have been rewarded with a sense of moral rights that generally people accept and and that 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 sense of moral rights is enshrined into legal rights through the passage of legislation and an effective enforcement yeah and i would hope that is seen that sort of liberation of animals is seen as part of a progressive agenda of social change which is to do with liberating people en masse but also certain classes of people who are still subjugated and still horribly and unacceptably abused and treated. Yeah. And uh, all of that is also is seen within the context of a consciousness to do that, that's planet-based, Gaia-based. So I think that is possible. I think that we have the chance of, of achieving that. But I think what is needed to get us there is going to be the kinds of pain that we're going through now with climate change and yeah. with pandemics. And there's going to be more pandemics because we're still abusing animals in a way which is going to make these things happen. So I think that I think that there's going to be challenging, negative, pessimistic activities that we're going to emerge from in order to end up in a more optimistic, interrelated existence on the planet. And so that's what I would see. I think also... One of the reasons why I serve on the board of the Culture and Animals Foundation is that we, one of the roles that we have is that we support creativity and imagination and, and the arts. And I think that there are an important emerging population of artists and other creatives who are imagining what the world will be like. Yeah. And I think that process is very important in the that Im- those imaginations help feed our, you know, people who don't have the time to think about it or look to something to help in- to inspire them. So I think that there's a, the, the human creativity is going to help highlight the problem of what we're facing and the work of Sue Coe comes to mind there. But there's also the other work of other artists who can also help us imagine what the world could be like what, if we were able to implement the kinds of things that that we wish to see happen as is ethical vegan animal advocates. Yeah, yeah. And I think reality is a very harsh teacher, but the human race, frustrating as it is, does eventually learn when it's really <laughs> taught harshly. And I think maybe you're right. It does, but we're very stupid people, I think, basically, <laughs> and very slow learners. We um, are slow learners, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And but I think you're right. The role that artists and creatives can play in painting a picture for us is part of the story. So there's the... Is the stick and the carrot. And your work's been a phenomenal contribution to moving us towards that more positive work world. Yeah, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much indeed. I think my contribution really is quite small in comparison to others, but, but I appreciate your thought. Thank you. Before we wrap up, what's the best way of people following you, reading your books, learning about your work and helping with your mission? The best ways include my website, which is a general sort of uh, place where my work is uh, recorded, and that's uh, kimstallwood.com. But I'm also on Facebook, Twitter as The Grumpy Vegan, mm, yeah. and on Instagram. So if you searched on Kim Stallwood or, and or The Grumpy Vegan, 
that's going to take you to the website and to my social media. That's great. And that, that's the best way to do that. Yeah. So I'll include li- links to all of those in the show notes as well. So people can thank you very much. look those up underneath the podcast on the YouTube. And everyone should read Growl too. I've just finished it this morning. It was an, an awesome, impressive and powerful read. So thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. So it's been an honor to talk to you today, Kim. Thank you so much. It's great to have you on our wall of sentientists and in our Facebook group as well. So it's great to have you as part of this loose community interested in these types of ideas. And it's been a genuine pleasure to talk to you today. Jamie, thank you very much. And, and, and congratulations on everything that you're doing with your projects. Uh, they're, they're remarkable. And, uh, and I hope that more and more people get to learn about them. Thank you so much.